Hello, everyone. Just waiting for the live stream to get set up onto YouTube. Hi, everyone. We have Ed here from Arbitrum, who's going to be doing a workshop on inside Arbitrum Nitro. Uh, workshops, or sorry, um, chat or questions, as always, go into the Zoom chat. Um, if you have any questions, definitely ask them, and Ed will um, ask, or answer them all at the end. And with that being said, I'll pass the mic off to Ed. Hey, thanks. Um, welcome, everybody. Thanks for your time today. Um, I want to talk about Arbitrum Nitro which is the latest and greatest version of the Arbitrum technology that I hope some of you know and love. Um, Nitro is a top to bottom rewrite of our software stack to make it faster, simpler, and, um, and cheaper to operate than our current Arbitrum stack. So Nitro is now on testnet and we're, we're driving toward um, migrating the Arbitrum mainnet onto the Nitro software stack. So I'm gonna talk about how this works. We'll, we'll go inside and, um, and, and really talk about, um, uh, try to give some idea of, of, of how it works on the inside. So I wanna start with um, basically four concepts that I'm gonna go over um, as we talk about how it works. Um, First, that it's an optimistic rollup. Second, that it functions by doing sequencing followed by deterministic execution, that we put geth at the core of the software and that we separate execution from proving. I'm gonna go into a lot more detail about what each of these mean, but this is just kind of a roadmap. Okay, so first, optimistic rollup. What does that mean? Um, well, first, it's a rollup. And rollups have uh, gotten a lot of attention lately. Probably one of the big things that drove attention to rollups is this uh, post by Vitalik um, uh, about a year and a half ago now, um, basically talking about a rollup centric roadmap for Ethereum. The idea is that rollups provide a level of scalability and low cost that the Ethereum chain itself um, has trouble providing. And so Vitalik talks here about a roadmap for Ethereum where Ethereum focuses on enabling rollups. Rollups provide the execution and storage layer for, uh, for applications. And Ethereum focuses on being the best uh, under, underlying layer for rollups. So that rollup centric roadmap, what that means is that the kind of technology that Arbitrum and Nitro is is the kind that is in the roadmap for, uh, for Ethereum to support and to become the main sort of execution layer for Ethereum. So what rollup means essentially is that the data of your transactions is stored onto the L1 Ethereum chain. It's an optimistic rollup because of the way that we settle transactions back to the Ethereum chain. Um, it's an optimistic protocol, which means it's a protocol that is always guaranteed to be correct but is especially fast and efficient when people behave according to their incentives. And I'll talk more about Ed, what that means. Yes. So sorry to interrupt, but um, you're not actually screen sharing your I'm slides not, right I'm now. I'm sorry, let me screen share. Uh, thank you. No worries. All righty. Okay. There you go, now you can see it. Okay, an Ethereum centric roadmap. Okay, the second thing about Nitro is that it operates by doing sequencing followed by deterministic execution. And this is where we really start to get into the nuts and bolts of how things work. I wanna tell the story of how uh, Arbitrum Nitro takes transactions and actually uh, executes them and finalizes them. So it starts with this component called the sequencer. The sequencer is currently a centralized component that's run by our team, the Arbitrum team, but we're, but we're moving toward a decentralized sequencer uh, approach. The sequencer's only job is to take transactions that are submitted by users and to put them into a, an order, into a sequence, in what order they arrive. The sequencer follows a first come, first served uh, approach to sequencing. Um, and the only thing that the sequencer is trusted to do is to say in what, which transactions arrived and in what order. 
There is a mechanism if the sequencer tries to censor you that you can bypass it and still get your transactions into the sequence. But I'm gonna skip that for simplicity in the explanation. So the sequencer's job, take these transactions that you submit and put them into sequence. Okay. Now, once the transactions have been sequenced, now the sequence transactions can be run through the state transition function. The state transition function is basically a piece of code, a piece of logic that says what each transaction does. And it's a fully deterministic function, meaning that if you give it the same inputs, it will always produce the same output. So the state transition function will take the next transaction in the sequence, and it will take the state of the chain, and it will do the, that deterministic computation on it. And the result of that will be to update the state. If your transaction does things like move assets around, it will, um, the state transition function will update the state to record the asset transfers and other things that have happened. And then the state, state transition function will sometimes emit a layer two um, arbitrum block. Okay, so this is how execution happens logically. Transactions are put into sequence and the sequence of transactions are run through the state transition function one at a time. Now, one thing to note about this is because the state transition function is fully deterministic, that once you know the sequence of transactions, that, that sequence of transactions fully determines how the state will evolve and it fully determines what the L2 blocks will be. And what that means is if you know what the sequence of transactions uh, is, then you operating all by yourself can execute the state transition function yourself in your own node and know what the result of computation on the chain is going to be, right? So everything follows, the, the, the sequence of blocks follows in a deterministic way from what this transaction sequence was. Okay, but how do you find out what the transaction sequence was? Well, the sequencer first publishes a feed of, um, of the sequence transactions. Anyone can subscribe to and receive that feed. And the sequencer produces that feed in real time. So you submit a transaction to the sequencer under normal conditions. In less than one second, your transaction will be sequenced and will appear in the feed. So that feed is the sequencer's promise as to what the sequence is that it's producing. This is, so if you believe the sequencer's promise, then you know in less than a second what the result of your transaction will be because you can subscribe to that feed, take the transactions on the feed and run them through the state transition function. And now you know everything about what the chain is doing. The sequencer will then every few minutes will take a batch of the sequence transactions and it will batch them together to make a big block of data. It will compress that data for efficiency and then it will write that compressed data onto the L1 Ethereum chain. And this records what the transaction sequence is. And as soon as that transaction, that Ethereum transaction that records the compressed batch, as soon as that has finality, then the sequence of transactions is final. And then everyone can look at that. They can execute the state transition, transition function for themselves and know exactly what the chain will do. So this is the, um, when the batched and compressed transactions are written to the L1 chain, then, then all of these transactions have finality because the L2 blocks are an inevitable consequence of that, of, of the, that batch and the batches previously recorded. Okay, now, so let's talk about finality and how finality works in this space. Um, there's basically three uh, forms of finality, if you will, in a system like this. The first is what I'll call soft finality, which comes in about one second. To get soft finality, you subscribe to that sequencer feed, you compute the state transition function on all of the transactions that are come out in the feed, and then you know the result. And the guarantee is that that is the correct result of what the chain will do, provided that the sequencer's feed is correct if the sequencer is being honest. The sequencer is making that promise. It has the power to keep that promise. So unless that you have finality within uh, one second or less. The second version is, is hard finality, which comes after about 10 minutes. So to get that hard finality, you watch the L1 Ethereum chain. You look for those compressed batches. You decompress each batch to know the transactions. You compute the state transition function on it. And then you wait for that a compressed batch to have finality on the Ethereum chain. 
And the guarantee there is this is as final as your L1 finality assumption. All right. And then finally, there is certification. And this is the process by which the Ethereum chain learns uh, what the result of computation is. Now, I said before that anyone who sees the transaction sequence can figure out what the chain does and know the result with certainty and finality. And that's true. So you might ask, why doesn't the Ethereum chain know in one second or 10 minutes what the result is? And the answer is the Ethereum chain doesn't have the computation power that you or your laptop or phone or really anyone has. Ethereum has a really slow and limited computation capability, which is why we're doing this layer two thing in the first place. So Ethereum cannot compute along with the chain, even though your laptop can. And so we need to use another method to uh, convince Ethereum what the result is. And that takes days, typically seven days. So you, uh, in order to see this, you just wait for the L2 blocks produced by the Arbitrum chain to be certified on the L1. This is really only used by L1 contracts. And that is, they're the only entities whose world is constricted, so they only see what Ethereum knows. All right. So that is how sequencing and deterministic execution works. The second piece of this is geth at the core. The idea here is that in order to have the arbitrum chain um, be compatible with Ethereum, um, as closely as possible, we actually take the core of Geth or Go Ethereum, which is the most popular and sort of authoritative um, uh, Ethereum node. And we take the core of Geth, which does EVM emulation and tracks the state, maintains the Ethereum state database and all of that stuff. And we actually build that into Arbitrum Nitro. So we use the very same code that Geth uses to do EVM emulation. So that's the geth core. On top of that geth core, we put a layer, which is not to scale here, it's actually much thinner, um, that we call ArbOS. So ArbOS basically takes on top of that geth core and it gives you the few additional things that you need in order to be an L2 chain. This is things like um, making sure that the sequencer gets reimbursed for its, um, for its Ethereum gas costs, it handles deposits and withdrawals, that is movements of ETH or tokens between Ethereum and the Arbitrum chain and, and, and various bookkeeping type functions. And then on top of that, we take node functionality. This is things that take your node and they turn it into a server that can respond to, uh, to uh, RPC requests from your wallet and, uh, and can do all of the things that an Ethereum node can do um, in terms of serving the user. So we sometimes uh, refer to this as a kind of geth sandwich. And the reason for this is that we have the geth core at the bottom that comes from, from this very standard geth Ethereum node. We have this ArbOS layer in the middle, which is custom. And then on the top, we have the node functionality, which again, mostly comes from the geth code. So that's the geth sandwich, right? Geth is the bread and this thin ArbOS layer is the, uh, uh, is the, uh, the payload in the sandwich. Okay. We then, now the state transition function I talked about before, the part that takes a transaction and the state and then updates the state and maybe produces a block. Remember that, that deterministic function? That's what I've outlined here on this slide in orange. It includes all of the geth core because it is taking care of emulating the Ethereum um, uh, making sure to emulate Ethereum execution and keep track of the state of the Arbitrum chain, just as if it were an Ethereum chain. And then also some pieces of ArbOS, the parts of ArbOS that are needed to keep track of things like deposits and withdrawals and accounting and so on. Those are in the state transition function, right? And so uh, this, is a, this setup is um, highly compatible with Ethereum um, because we use the geth core for EVM emulation and because we use geth code at the top on this, as the top bread in the sandwich um, to be compatible with the uh, network, with the um, RPC API that Ethereum, that, uh, that Ethereum nodes um, provide. All right, let me move on to the last piece now, which is separating execution from proving. 
Okay, so remember this piece, right? This is what I just showed you. Um, this is uh, the blue part is the full node software. The orange part is that state transition function, which is the part that needs to run correctly and reliably and provably in order to guarantee a correct outcome. So we take that blue piece, the entire node, and you can compile it to native code just using a standard compiler. This software is all, pretty much all written in Go. And so we use the standard Go compiler and you can compile that to run on your machine um, or you can, um, and then you can run that as a node. So if you're running an, an Arbitrum Nitro node, you just are running a program that runs on your machine, which is compiled from all of this blue stuff. And it will do all of the things that you would expect a node to do. We then take separately the orange piece, just that state transition function, and we compile that using the same Go compiler, but instead of compiling to native code that should run directly on your machine, we instead compile it to WASM or WebAssembly format, uh, which is a machine independent um, and efficiently executable format for uh, expressing code, which is developed by a consortium of, uh, of, of companies and developers. Um, and so we use that for proving. So if there is a dispute between different parties in our protocol about what the state transition function, this orange outlined code should do, um, that dispute is resolved or refereed in the context of this WASM code. So the WASM code is the definition of what the correct uh, execution of the code of the state transition function will be. And the beauty of this sort of dual compilation mode is that in ordinary execution, when you're just running a node and the chain is running along, it's running as native code, which is the fastest way to run a geth type functionality. So you get a lot of speed by doing that. But then if there's a dispute and you need to do proving, proving doesn't need to be quite as fast and efficient, but it needs to be extremely portable and reliable and secure, which is what WASM is, is excellent at. So we use that for proving. And this is one of the core tricks that allows Nitro to be really fast and also to be fully provable. Okay, let me talk about how the proving mechanism works uh, because this is part of the secret sauce. And in fact, this is the part of Arbitrum that we devised first back in 2014. Um, this is, um, um, and with, there's a question um, in the chat which is if soft finality is one second, hard finality is 10 minutes, what time frame can I do a dispute with it? Um, and the answer is uh, you get seven days to do a dispute. So you have finality very quickly. Finality means that the result of the transaction is inevitable. People can still dispute it because someone could try to make a false claim about what the outcome will be. But if you're an honest party, you can force, if, if your transaction has finality, that means that you acting alone can force the correct outcome of your transaction through our protocol, no matter what everyone else does. If every other person in the world is evil, but you know what the correct outcome of your transaction is, you can force that result. And that's why we say you have finality because if you, uh, because anyone can enforce the correct outcome. Okay, so how does this work? How do we actually prove or resolve disputes? Let me dig into that. So, um, and this is how we actually settle the result of transactions back to the Ethereum chain. So it starts with Alice, who's just some, uh, some arbitrary person in the protocol. And Alice makes a claim and she puts down a stake to back that claim. And her claim is this. She claims that in the, in the current state of the chain, that is the start state that everyone agrees on, that after the chain executes n blocks, creates n blocks, that the end state will be some particular thing. Now these states are really just um, cryptographic hashes of the state, so they're small. Um, but because execution is deterministic, there is a correct answer about what the end state is. So on this diagram, I've drawn the start state in black because everyone agrees that that's correct, that's known correct. And I've drawn the end state in orange to reflect the fact that Alice claims that it's true, but it might or might not be true. So Alice makes this claim. Then a challenge window opens up a period of time in which everyone can look and see if they agree with what Alice said. 
And if they do agree, then they don't need to do anything. You could just sit back and wait. And if the challenge period passes after seven days and no one has disagreed with Alice's claim, then uh, Alice's claim will be accepted and the protocol will move forward. And that is the common case. Alice has staked on her claim. So her incentive is to make a claim that's correct. And other people would have to stake to dispute it. And if her claim is correct, that would be foolish of them. But let's say that Bob actually disagrees. Bob responds and he says, no, um, I, I, the start state is the same, but I think the end state is different. And now I've drawn the end state in red to show that we know that Alice and Bob disagree about what the end state is. Alice has what makes one claim, Bob's make it makes a different claim. And what the protocol is going to do is identify one of them as being a liar. So how does that work? Well, the first thing Bob does is in addition to saying what he thinks the end state should be, the protocol forces him to make a claim about what the state is halfway through after n over two blocks, right? So now Bob logically has made two claims that each are n over two blocks. And now, now it's Alice's move in the protocol. So Alice has to do one of two things. She can either say, I she can either disagree with Bob's mid state, in which case we're in the top one of Alice's choices here. If she disagrees with Bob's mid, mid state, now you have a situation where she agrees on the start, where the two of them agree on the start state, they disagree on the mid state. So this looks just like the situation up at the top of the slide, except we've cut the number of blocks in half. Alternatively, maybe Alice agrees with Bob's mid state. And in that case, we have the uh, situation at the bottom where Alice and Bob agree on what the mid state is, but they disagree on the end state. And again, this looks like the, uh, uh, the, the diagram Alice's initial claim up at the top, except half as large. So Alice is gonna pick one or the other of those um, to do, depending on whether she agrees or disagrees with Bob's mid state. And let's say that Alice uh, agrees with Bob's mid state and chooses this one, okay? So now Alice has done that, that's her response. And now we force her to again, break her claim in half by, by claiming what is the state halfway between um, halfway through that n series of n over two blocks, All right? Well, now that looks like Bob's situation in the middle, except again, half as large. And so now it's Bob's turn. He's gonna have to identify one of the two sides of Alice's claim and break that in half and so on. And so you can see that in each round of this protocol, we cut the number of blocks under dispute in half. So after a logarithmic number of rounds, we get down to a dispute about a single block. Right? And this is a very efficient protocol because Alice and Bob are doing all the work. There is a contract on the L1 Ethereum chain, which is the referee in this protocol, but it's just like making sure, um, did Bob post a claim about the midpoint? And did Alice say whether she's disagreeing with the left or right half of Bob's claim? And did Bob post, a, and did Alice then post a claim about what she thinks the middle state is and so on. The referee at this point just makes sure that each player actually makes a move that looks legal-ish. And by doing that, the parties do all the work and you get down to a disagreement about one block. All right, so now here's the full challenge protocol. So we started with step one up, up at the beginning, Alice made a claim about the result of N blocks of computation and Bob disagrees. We bisect the dispute down to a disagreement about one block. Now, what happens inside that block? They dis they're disagreeing about that block. Well, Alice now claims how many steps of computation, how many individual instructions of WASM get, got executed by the state transition function to produce that block. Alice makes that claim. And now you can again do bisection, but now you're doing it over steps of computation. And the states are states of the, um, are states of the WASM execution. So you again bisect down to one step of computation. So like one add instruction or one memory read instruction or something like that in WASM. And once you've done that, Alice then submits a proof of just that one step of computation. Um, and at that point, we'll know who is lying or telling the truth. Now this protocol guarantees that a party who's telling the truth can always win the game and force the liar to lose. And so the result of this is that um, we're going to identify a liar, that liar will lose their stake, half the stake goes to the other party, and then we're able to prune off the claim that that liar made. 
And so if, you're, if you make a collect, correct claim, you will eventually be able to prune off all the counterclaims that might disagree with it, and then your claim will be accepted. So that's how the protocol works. Uh, one a nuance here is that we don't actually bisect into two pieces. Um, we instead, for efficiency, break into about 400 pieces, with Alice or Bob putting about 399 uh, intermediate points and the other party choosing one very small subsegment. That just reduces the number of rounds. But that's basically the challenge protocol. And you can show that, um, that, um, that uh, uh, by using this protocol, that a party who is correct and telling the truth can always force the correct outcome to be accepted. Okay, so that's Arbitrum Nitro in a, in a nutshell. You can try it out. Uh, it's running on a public, uh, public test net. We call it a DevNet um, that runs on top of, of the Gorley um, Ethereum test net. Uh, there's a URL here on how to get to it and how to use it. We're really excited about Nitro. It's on test net. It's going to be a huge step forward in scalability order of magnitude improvement in throughput and, uh, and gas cost reduction. Um, we're, we're not making promises, but um, if I were a betting man, I'd say maybe a factor of two reduction in gas cost um, over what is currently on, uh, uh, on Arbitrum. Um, we are also working on follow-on technologies, including something called Arbitrum AnyTrust, which is able to drive down the cost further, but I don't have time to talk about that today. So that is it. Um, one more thing, um, the mandatory please come and work for us. Um, jobs at offchainlabs.com or reach out to me. Um, I am Ed Felton um, on Twitter or Telegram with uh, this name here. So that's it. Let me go back to the, um, to the DevNet URL and then um, any additional questions by chat. Great, yeah, we do have a few questions in the chat I see there. Um, I don't know if you see it on your end. Um, I, okay, I've answered, let's see, a couple- I think that, you answered both, actually. Yes, I believe uh, I've answered both. I, I have a question, Ed, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Sure, so um, I have a question around fraud. Um, I was yeah. speaking to a lending team and they said that their users are transacting with, you know, with lending and borrowing on Arbitrum and fraud occurs. What happens to their users who are lending and borrowing, you know, when fraud is confirmed? If fraud is confirmed, well, nothing happens. Um, the um, essentially nothing happens. So the way the way we think about so if you're a normal user of the system, you won't even know that someone tried fraud. Um, what I mean by that is that honest Arbitrum nodes just look at the transaction sequence and they um, compute the state transition function for themselves. And so they know what the correct outcome of the chain is. So the fact that a bunch of people are over somewhere else uh, quarreling about what the outcome is, um, in that sense, doesn't matter. So from the user experience standpoint, the fact that someone attempts to, to commit fraud uh, is not something that you'll ever see. Um, what you see as a user, if you're connected to an honest Arbitrum node, just like if you're connected to an honest Ethereum node, you see a chain that just marches forward um, and, um, and that executes correctly. Um, and because of that very strong guarantee, um, you, uh, because of that very strong guarantee that any one honest uh, party in, in the uh, dispute protocol can force a correct outcome, um, as an ordinary user, you don't have to worry about it. And the user experience is that you don't even see it. Um, you, see, you see correct execution and you see finality in either the one second time frame or the 10 minute time frame, depending on, um, on what kind of node you're connected to. That's awesome, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Great, yeah. do we have any more questions? I think we're slowly running out of time here. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, well, okay. thank you very much, Ed. That was very informative. I'm sure everyone that was part of this uh, really enjoyed it. Thanks, everyone. And feel free to reach out. My, um, my Twitter and Telegram contact um, uh, address are on the bottom of this slide now. Perfect. There's also a, a Discord channel as well under ETH Global Sponsor Discord yeah. for Arbitrum, so you could find uh, the team there. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. We'll uh, talk soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye.